Well, we're into this message this morning. And as you know, we are in a series um, that we are entitling Kingdom, Kingdom Citizenship. And this is part six, believe it or not. Kingdom Citizenship, part six. And I'm dealing with a little subheading within this series, which is entitled, How Can I Support the Testimony of My Church? How Can I Support the Testimony, the Witness of my church and over the last few weeks we've gone into that and we've talked about that and uh, we looked at uh, up until now three uh, messages three titles in this little series of how can I support the testimony of my church the first one that we came up with was by attending church faithfully we support the witness the testimony of this church of the Church of Jesus Christ by attending church faithfully number two by supporting our church community and number three by honoring God's house by honoring God's house today I want to give uh, a fourth way in which we can support the testimony of our church and it's a simple heading and this is what it is by living a godly life by living a godly life now what does that mean that takes or needs some unpacking what do we mean by living a godly life what do we mean uh, by uh, the necessity of developing godly character because that's what living a godly life means it means developing um, a godly character now a thought came to me this morning and it's this you can't gain permanent residency you can't gain permanent residency in the kingdom of God without maintaining good Christian character you can kind of like fly, you know, run into the kingdom of God have a little visit have a little stay say hi to everybody you know stay for the weekend but you'll run out again very quickly if you do not develop Christian character it's Christian character that helps us to develop, I'm using a picture here if you like, of permanent residency in a country or in a, in a land uh, or in a nation. In order to get permanent residency into the kingdom of God, in order to get permanent residency, eternal life with Jesus, we have to develop and maintain Christian character. Now, one of the things I tend to one of the pillars of my life is this concept that I have of the understanding that one needs to be disciplined. One needs to be disciplined. I don't know where it came from, probably from my parents, probably some of it from my personality character. But when I was young, I liked the idea of the military and I went and joined the boys brigade. And I spent many years in the boys brigade. And after the boys brigade, I joined the army cadets and I spent a good few years in the army cadets in the medical corps and I liked those two organizations because they taught and promote discipline and I thought discipline was an important concept for one's life I was always when I was younger as well very athletic and I used to run I used to be a sprinter and I would run 100 200 400 800 uh, and I would do long jump triple jump discus and a number of different things and me and my brother Derek would go to meetings and we would clean up, we'd come back with three trophies, four trophies, five trophies each from different boys brigade meetings because we disciplined ourselves in physical exercise and in developing our skill as athletes because we just felt that that was what we wanted to do. So discipline for me um, was something that I thought was important and to me today I think is still very important. I am on a journey of self-mastery, self-mastery. In other words, I want to master myself, I want to master my character, I want to master my appetites, I want to master myself, I want to bring myself under leadership and rulership. I don't want to be carried away by fads, fashions, whims, feelings, emotions, desires, I want to discipline myself so that I'm doing the best I can all the time. At the root of that, I think, is I'm really a very competitive person, not in a negative sense, 
I don't compete against other people. I completely ignore everyone else. I'm competing against myself or against a standard that I've set for myself. And because of that, I'm, I'm extremely competitive and I keep pressing, like Paul said, I think he was a very competitive guy in this sense. I press towards the mark of the higher calling. Which higher calling? Which is to be found in Christ Jesus. I have discovered that there is no higher authority or no higher standard to live your life by than Christ. So I have submitted myself to him and to his standard. And that is the mark, the measure that I am using for every decision that I'm making on a daily basis. Now, don't get me wrong. You've heard some nice things said about me. And, uh, you know, you may have heard that I'm a nice guy. But trust me, I have to constantly work on myself and I realize that you cannot be complacent because I have to keep on desiring to do the right thing and I have learned that all kinds of thoughts and influences will come at you from every corner but you have to sort those influences and those thoughts out in your mind and decide that you're going to stay true to the sat nav my sat nav keeps redirecting me no matter what I hear, no matter what I think, no matter what I want to do, no matter what my flesh is screaming at me, do this, do this, do this. My sat nav keeps redirecting me to follow Christ. And Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Amen. And there have been many individuals in my life that I have followed because they followed Christ in a way that has made me think, I want to emulate what they are doing. And if they can do it, I sure can do it too. Amen? And so I'm on a quest for personal mastery, which is what I believe to be maintaining good Christian discipline. Now, when you're on that quest, it's not going to be easy. In fact, it's going to be very hard. It's going to be painful. There's a lot of things you have to say no to in order to say yes to that one thing that is good, that one thing that is best, that one thing that is perfect. So every day, there are things that I have to say no to. No to lying in bed, no to quitting, no to being lazy, no to compromising, no to venting my feeling, no to speak in my mind, no to responding to people how I think they deserve to respond, no to rendering evil for evil those things are not really an option for me don't get me wrong i think them my flesh sometimes wants them i'm in a battle i'm fighting it all the time and that's why paul says fight the good fight of faith how many know that we're in a fight we're in a battle and that's why paul says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood it's not the people tell it to your neighbor and tell them it's not the people that is the problem. It's not the people that is the problem. Tell them, it's your flesh. It's not the people that is the problem. It's your flesh. Why your flesh? Because uh, the spiritual forces of this world are trying to influence your character, your flesh, your decisions, your conduct, your behavior. And you are in a battle and you are fighting. Let me see the hands of those who are fighting, who are wrestling. <laughs> this is a wrestling match, man. And um, it's a tension to manage. You know, we love that saying, some things are not a problem to solve, but a tension to manage. You're never going to solve this problem. You're always going to have the flesh. You're always going to be fighting against the flesh. You're always going to be fighting against the evil desires of the flesh and the enticing things that come your way. But you have to fight. You have to press. You have to pursue. You have to run as though you're in a race and you want to win it. Paul uses that analogy. Paul was in that time of the Roman games and the early Olympics, if you like, the, the, the wrestling matches and the boxing matches and the running contests. And so Paul used the sporting analogy very often to explain what we are in. And so... What is Christian maturity? Christian maturity is Christ-likeness. That means that we're trying to become like Christ. And in order for my image to become like Christ, someone's going to have to do a lot of chiseling away because there's too much of me 
and not enough of him. <laughs> so God's got to get the hammer and the chisel to me and start chopping off bits of me that are not like Christ. And I have to accept that God's going to be doing that work in me and on me. But the people who are most successful with it are the people who voluntarily put themselves before the Lord and say, you know, like we used to say, me and my, our musicians used to have this joke amongst ourselves, you know, when you got caught out by someone and you had to concede, we would go like that, like a, a, an enslaved person with their hands bound, and we would say, take me, take me, take me, take me. In other words, I submit. We have to say to Christ, take me, take me. Yeah? So, how do I, how, how do I know when I've attained Christian character or Christian maturity? How do I know what Christian maturity looks like? Now, I want to ask you a question. On a scale of 1 to 10, just give yourself a checkup from the neck up. Rate yourself. Don't rate anybody else. Waste of time. You can't really help other people in that way. You've got to work on yourself. Okay? So, on a scale of 1 to 10, where would you say your Christian character is? Where would you say, how far do you think you've arrived in terms of your Christian character? conduct don't say it to anybody else but just rate yourself as to where you think you are in your journey of christian conduct i know if i rated myself there's a number that comes right back at me and i, I kind of think oh yeah I, I think i'm there but you know as the clark sisters used to say i'm not where i want to be but i'm not where i used to be you know I, i've moved on i'm making progress all the time now here's another question for you how far do you feel you could move the needle of your Christian maturity, of your, of, of, of your, your Christ-like character? How far do you think you could move the needle? Do you think you could move it one or two notches? I think you could. I think we could always move it a, a little further. Now, Paul said to the Philippians church, he spoke to them about the kind of life that they're living, uh, uh, that, that he wanted them to live, and I want to speak to you about the kind of life that we want to encourage you to live. And here's what he said in the scripture, Philippians 1, 27. He says, whatever happens, whatever you go through, whatever circumstances you're experiencing, make sure that your everyday life is worthy of the gospel. Man, I love that instruction from my, my, my daddy, Paul, my father in the faith. Whatever happens, whatever they do to you, Whatever they say to you, whatever you're going through, whatever you feel like, make sure that your everyday life is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, it is possible for our lives to be worthy of the gospel of Christ or unworthy of the good news, the testimony, the death and the resurrection of Christ. Christ has standards. Amen? He has standards. And so this is speaking about my personal conduct. It's speaking about my interaction with other people. It's speaking about my character under pressure. Sometimes I go into my tea box and I pull out a tea bag and the label has disappeared. And I put it into the cup and I'm wondering what flavor is this? And I never know what flavor it is until I pour hot water on it. And sometimes we don't know what flavor we are until hot water is poured on us. It's when you're under pressure that it begins to expose the development, the level of development of your Christian character and your Christian conduct. Amen? Now, you have to decide how much you're going to take. And, and, and some of us say, well, no, 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 no. That's, they're, they're, take, they're going too far. I've, I've had enough. I'm not taking it. I'm not, I'm not having it. Brothers and sisters, you've got to make up your mind that you're going to take it all. No matter how much they throw at you, that you are going to take it all. If you want to master life and if you want to be a winner, you have to decide that you are going to take it all. That whatever they throw at you, you're going to manage it. You're going to take what they give you, you're going to, you're going to do something with it, and you're going to throw it back to them better than what they gave to you. And that's a decision that you have to make in your own life. Now, each and every one of us are ambassadors of Christ. You may think that you're some dibby dibby riffraff, but you're not. 
You're not a DBDB riffraff. You are an ambassador. You are a minister. You are a servant. You are an emissary of Jesus. And the quickest Bible that people read is you. People are reading you to see what Christ is really like. In fact, many of us experienced it in the workplace where people that eventually come to us and say, what is it about you? What is it about you? Well, I've noticed that because they've been reading you all this time and then they realize there's something different about you. And that is where we need to be. Now, some people like to split their life up, break their life up into little compartments. We got the home life, we got the work life, we got the social life. But I want to encourage you to reach for the high life. <laughs> the high life. Amen? <laughs> we can't split our life up into different compartments. So we're one person at home, we're one person at work, and we're one, another person when we go out socially. I believe that for some Christians, our work colleagues would be shocked if they moved in to live with us for a week. And saw how we behave. They were like, what is this? Some of them may not even be Christians and yet they may have their lives more together than us. Because sometimes, even as Christians, non-Christians of course, sometimes we live a different life at work than we live at home. You know when people are dressed up to go to work, you know, they put on their best garments. You know, the foundation goes on, the makeup goes on, the lipstick goes on. The tie goes on, the brooch goes on, you know, the earring goes on, guys, whatever it is, yeah. And we turn up to work and we just look beautiful. We look the best. The suit is like, you know, Armani or whatever it is you can afford to wear. You know, for me it's Marks and Spencers, that's my designer label, right? And you turn up for work and you look, you look the part. But Paul said, it's not the outward adorning. But it's the inward adoring, a godly character, humility, right standing. It's, it's, it's those characteristics that we need to be more concerned about. Now, here's a question for you. Does your home life match your work life? You know you can't play like that at work. You've got to be on your best behavior at work. But did you know you're supposed to be on your best behavior at home? The people that should see the best of your character is not your workmates or your social mates. It's your, the people you live with. Because you know what they say in the Caribbean? They probably say it all over the world in different ways. See me and come live with me. A two completely different team. To see me and to live with me are completely two different things. Because when you see me, you know, you look at me and you, you fancy me, you like me. But when you start dating me, then you're getting to know me. And what we need to do, our Christian quest, is to make sure that the simi and the come live with me is actually the same person. You, you know, those movies, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You're one person during the day and at night you're another person. No, we need to be the same person at home that we are at work. And that is my responsibility. Early on in my Christian life, my wife, who is a trained professional counselor, don't ask her for counseling lessons, uh, but she began to talk me that I must use eye language and I must take responsibility for my own behavior. This was a new concept to me. What are you talking about? Use eye language. Take responsibility. You're responsible for the way I'm behaving right now. You made me say that. You made me do it. She had to teach me, school me over years. No, 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 no. Take responsibility for your own behavior. Now I've got to the point where I take total responsibility for my own conduct. It doesn't matter how bad you are. It doesn't matter how you test me and try me. I have determined that I'm going to conduct myself in a certain way. And you are not going to determine for me my standard of living. I'm going to determine that for myself. And the word is my mirror 
that's going to determine. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say I'm perfect and I never get it wrong. I never make a mistake. I never slip. I'm not saying that at all. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is that this is my default. This is my standard. This is what I'm trying to attain. Amen? And I discipline myself when that is concerned. Now, there's an interesting scripture in 1 Peter 5, 8. We don't have it on the slides. But uh, Peter says to the saints, be sober. Wake up and smell the coffee. Smell the smelling salts. Wake up, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is walking around on the earth like a roaring lion. Seeking whom he may devour. Now, do you want to be mincemeat for the devil? You know, sometimes they say concerning dogs that the dog, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. His, his bark is louder than his bite. I don't care about that. You know, I don't want that dog sniffing me. I'm like, go ahead, go dog, go ahead, go ahead, move, move. I don't want that dog sniffing me. Oh, don't worry. He, 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 his, his bark is louder than his bite. I ain't risking it for a biscuit. I don't want to find out. I don't want that dog anywhere near me. I don't want that roaring lion. Now, the devil. Now, you can't say that about the devil. His, 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 his bark is louder than his bite. Let me tell you, his, 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 his bark, his roar is loud and his bite is even heavier. If the devil bites you, you will know about it. He don't play. And Peter says he's like a roaring lion seeking around, snooping around the world looking for people to devour and it's a little bit like them zombie films you know you know the zombie film when the zombie catches you and touches you it's like he's playing ad you turn into a zombie and then the two of you now start looking for more and the two of you start touching people and they all turn into zombies and it's a bit like that the works of the flesh is something we have to be careful of because when somebody zaps us with that bad spirit we might turn into them and the two of us now in the house behaving like duppy. And then we go to work behaving like duppy. And we go to church behaving like duppy. And we go to our social things behaving like duppy. For those of you who don't know what duppy is, duppy is like goats. Somebody come back from the dead. Zombie. Caribbean phrase for zombie. Yeah? And we all become zombies walking around affecting one another. We don't want that. So, so, so Peter says, be careful. Now, here's what Paul says to the Romans in uh, the Roman church. Uh, uh, Romans 12, 1, he says, I beseech you. He's reduced himself now to begging and pleasing. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, this is deep, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is, of course, your reasonable service. You know, now, what's he talking about there? He's talking about temple worship and making sacrifices, either to the god uh, Yahweh or to the gods that the Romans worshipped, the, you know, the purality of their gods. But he's saying that, see yourself as a living sacrifice, something that's being offered unto God. God won't just take any old stinking dirty sacrifice. It has to be clean. It has to be without blemish. It often has to be the firstborn. You know, God has standards about what he will receive for an offering. And when you present an offering to a loved one, you make sure that that offering is of a standard. And Paul says, your body must be of a standard and you must offer it unto God. And he says that that is only reasonable for you since you enlisted yourself in this army. Nobody came out there and dragged you and said you have to be a Christian. You decided that you wanted to be a Christian of your own free will. You decided that you would testify that you're done with the old life. You decided to sing the song, I'm running from a life. I'm running from a life. If anybody asks you, what's the matter with you, my friend? Tell them that I'm saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, water baptized, and I'm running for my life. That was your testimony. So live up to it then. Keep running for your life. Because the devil is like a roaring lion roaming around seeking whom he can devour and he'd quite like to devour you and turn you into a zombie. 
Now you know when you look at the physical life, you know that there are stages that we have to go through in order to become mature. It's like that with spiritual life. You know we're all born, uh, the Caribbean people say like, uh, well you took me just born like this? You know, you took me born 55 or 60? No, I was a baby once. I went through stuff. So we're all born as a baby. We then go through in infancy. And you know, as an infant, you have to learn to stand. You have to learn to crawl. You crawl first, then you start standing. Then you start walking. Then you start running around like these kids after the soap. They're running around and they're giggling and they're having fun. And that's infancy. But if the kid is still doing that at 14, you're kind of like wondering what's going on. You should have passed infancy stage. You should have now gone on to childhood. So when you become a child from an infant, you now have to learn how to play nicely with your brothers and sisters. How to play nicely with the other kids in the nursery. How not to squabble. How to share. You have to learn how to speak nicely. You have to learn how to laugh and enjoy yourself as an infant, as a child. Then you get into adolescence. And anyone who's tried to raise adolescents, I've had a few of them in my house over the years, one of the biggest challenges to, show, to teach adolescents is how to wash themselves properly. <laughs> how to keep their bedroom clean. How to wash their toilet after them and wash their sink after them. Because I don't want to be going in there washing out all your mouth water and your toothpaste that you spat in the sink and left there. No, 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 no. I'm going to teach you how to do that. I'll teach you how to wash up the dishes after you've had a meal. I'm not going to be running around slaving after you all the time. You are an adolescent and you need to learn this stuff now. Amen? So you've got to learn how to clean, how to wash, how to discipline, and how to interact with people. When you get into your early adulthood, you need to learn how to forgive. You need to learn how to give. You know, with some of my grandsons, the way I've taught them how about giving is like, we might pull up at McDonald's, and I buy the McDonald's, and I ask them, can I have a chip? And if they tell me no, I just take the whole packet and eat the whole packet. <laughs> I'll buy them another one, but I've got to teach them that if you don't give a tithe, you're going to lose everything. <laughs> I'm going to teach them that basic principle. They're going to learn that from a child. Yeah? Now my kids are like, oh, can I have, what? Can I have a chip? Oh, yeah, granddad, here, 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 here. You, you can have a chip. So I take one or two just to see what they're like and, you know, I say, well done, man, you passed the test. Can I have a bite of your Big Mac? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They now realize who's paying for the Big Mac. They now realize how they're going to get another Big Mac. They now realize that if you're ungrateful to God, God might stop handing out golden tokens. Amen? So you've got to teach them uh, early adulthood. In the spiritual sense, there are things that we need to learn as well. You can't just become a Christian and stop growing. And, and how do you grow as a Christian? Let the, the athletes will tell you. The, the singers and the dancers will tell you, by exercising your muscles, by going to the gym. The gym for spiritual life is to meet up with difficult people. Some of us have been blessed. God has given us a gym at home. It's called a wife or a husband. You don't have to go out your house to exercise. You can exercise right there in the bedroom, right there in the kitchen, right there in the dining room. God has given you a super gym in your own house. So you can work out. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Yes, brother, work it. Work it. Work it. Let me tell you something. Many of you know that Lord and I have got completely different uh, personalities. We share the same values. We share the same principles. There are, we have a lot in common. But my personality, I'm an extrovert. You probably realize that by now. I'm outgoing. Lorna is essentially an introvert until she's really passionate. Then she is quite an aggressive extrovert. <laughs> I like crowds. I go to West End and I go, people! And I suck all their energy and I feel great. Lorna's like, it's been one hour. They're, they're zapping me. I'm leaving. No, Lorna! We're going to be the last ones to leave the party. Well, I'm off. you got your own car. I'll see you at home. <laughs> we got different personalities. 
But I tell you what, that has been the most incredible thing for my life because I've been astonished at some of the things she doesn't want to do and some of the things she does want to do. I've been astonished at some of the way she thinks. She's been astonished at some of the way I think. And those differences help us to, as my sister-in-law used to say, rub it smooth like butter. <laughs> so you've got a bag of nuts, but you've got to rub those nuts smooth until they're like butter. A lot of friction. Look, Lorne and I have been practicing on each other for over, how, how many years now? 40 years. Wow, I was going to say 34 years, but you know, doesn't time fly when you're having fun? Sometimes I forget. 40 years we've been together. Okay, so uh, we've had all that time to work on each other and to, you know, it's not, it's not easy. It's not been easy. But we've just decided that we respect each other, that we love each other, that we're best friends, and that comes what may, we're going to suck it up. And we're going to do life together. And we understand, I understand that she's not the enemy. I've worked, I want, do you know what? She's not the enemy. If anything, I'm probably the enemy. This means that I need to get better, not bitter. And that's my philosophy with everyone. When people offend me or people don't do what they're supposed to do or people just, I'm just like bemused at the decision making of people that affects me, I just say, don't get bitter, get better. Because people will disappoint. You know, the person I'm most disappointed with in my life is me, if I'm really honest. I've failed myself more than anyone has ever failed me. I've made more mistakes and done myself stuff more than anyone else has ever done me. The discipline of my mistakes have made me who I am. Am I going to fall out with me? No, I'm going to love myself. And the Bible says that I should love others even as I love myself. Let's move quickly now because we've got to get, get through this. Um, Galatians 5, 19 to 25 speaks here about the works of the, the flesh. You know, Paul says, when I was a child... I, I acted like a child, I behaved like a child, and I did childish things, but now I've become a man, I've put off childish things, and now I mature, and so I behave like I'm mature. Do you know what some of us need to do? We need to take more pride in ourselves. We need to tell ourselves, I'm better than that. I'm bigger than that. I've got better character than that. I could say something, but I won't. Why? Because I'm better than that. Do not practice to just vent your feelings, say anything, be anyhow, do anything, follow the crowd, you know, compete with people. Whenever you see people competing, you know, the root cause of competing an argument is guess what? Ego. And the root cause of ego is arrogance, which is a higher estimation of yourself than what you ought to have. That is the root of most arguments. You feel to yourself that you are higher than you really are and you must win the argument and nobody can't tell you nothing. That is not the way to be. Let's hit the scripture. Now the works of the flesh are evident which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, Selfish ambition, dissension, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, and revelries. I wish I had time to unpack all those words. Go home and read that in the Message Bible. It's shocking. You know, there are people going to see soothsayers and going to uh, Gypsy Lee to have their tea bags read or going to see the Obia man to see if he can fix the relationship for them. These things are not of God. We don't do that as Christians. We rely on the Holy Spirit. We rely on, on the Lord. Adultery means having additional love relationships while you are married. Fornication means having sexual interactions with people, male or female, when you are not married. Lewdness, exposing yourself, getting involved in illicit behavior like many of our pop stars do. They come out half naked on the stage. They wear anything, or they wear nothing now. <laughs> the problem is not that they wear anything, the problem is now they don't wear enough. Okay? Uh, hatred, I hate you! I hate you with a passion! 
Contention. Yeah, you want to you argue about it? Yeah, let's argue about it. You want to talk about it? Yeah, let's talk about it. Contentions. Jealousy. Well, you see him? I can't take him. I can't stand him. I want what he's got. Outbursts of wrath. You explode in the middle of a situation and anything comes out of your mouth. Your, the lack of self-discipline. Selfish ambitions. I want it my way. I, I've got to be the top dog. This is all about me. I want my name in lights. I want to be recognized. Dissensions. Let's argue about it. Let's quarrel about it. Hear what I'm saying? Envy, murder, drunkenness, excessive alcohol drinking till we've lost all of our senses. We're no longer in control of what we're doing and where we're going and what we're saying. Reveries, parties, raves, Christians coming to church Sunday, Saturday night they're in the club. All the, 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 the vulgarities of the lyrics are coming at you. All of those messages are going into your mind. All of those messages are influencing you. And then you're wondering why you do the things that you do. Understand that when you go into certain environments and you start listening to certain music, expect that there are certain spirits that are trying to cling to you. Know that when you go into a dance or a club or a music place and all they're doing is playing love songs and speaking about illicit affairs, me and Mrs. Jones, and we got a thing going on and all that stuff, and you're just... That is, that is cleverly designed to entice you, to manipulate you, and to draw you captive. And you should be at that point thinking, get off me. Because those spirits are now trying to entice you and to seduce you and to manipulate your sentiment. There are times where I listen to a pop song just once or twice and I can't get it out of my head. And I have to go and listen to a worship song over and over again to wash my brains or brainwash myself. There are certain anthems that sound great, worldly songs that just sound great. Uh, I think Ray Jan calls them songs of fools. Songs of fools. You've got gospel songs, you've got songs of fools. And as those songs begin to work on you, they start to work in you. And then they start to work through you. Timothy puts, uh, Paul says to Timothy, I'm going to wrap up in a few minutes. Now, the Holy Spirit, this is uh, 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 5. Now, the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last days, some will turn away from the true faith. He's talking now about Christians. He's talking now about the church. Some will turn away from true faith. That doesn't mean they don't have a faith. They have a faith. But they don't have a false faith or a corrupted faith or a pseudo faith. So they go up to get their award half naked. They're about to curse some bad word. They've just got an award for a song that is full of vulgarity and, and sin and sensualness. And the first thing they do is, I want to thank God for helping me to write this song. <laughs> Which God? Not the God of heaven and earth. He don't have nothing to do with that. We know you've got other gods. Tell us which God you're talking about. Because you can't be thanking Jehovah God for that because he will have nothing to do with unrighteousness. So they have a form of godliness, a form of faith. And it says that they will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. Teachings that come from devils. Oh, it's okay. I could be a Christian and do that. You can be a Christian and do that. Who, who told you you can't do that? You know they've got churches for that. What kind of church? The synagogue of Satan. That's the kind of church. Uh, in, in Galatians 5... 22 he tells us that opposing uh, but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long suffering suffering long and still being kind kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control against such there is no law you need to read these scriptures go home and read these scriptures take a photo of it write it down go home and read these scriptures in the amplified version and in uh, the message version for them to be amplified to you now, my closing couple of scriptures is this, Romans 12, 18. If it be possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. 
as much as is possible. Nike said, just do it. Just do it. It's possible, man. Just do it. As much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5, read this when you go home. In the last days, perilous times will come, for men shall be lovers of themselves. They'll be heady, they'll be high-minded, they'll be truce breakers, they'll be liars, they'll, have, they'll, they'll be without affection, they'll be cold, they'll be callous. Isn't that what we're seeing in our schools? Man is carrying, boys are carrying knives as long as they're armed. And when they, when they see you on the street and they light your Canada goose, or whatever it is you're wearing, and, you, and they ask you, for, hey bro, what, what size is that you're wearing, dear? What size is that? What's it got to do with you? What size is that? You tell them the size. Oh, I quite like that, you know. And then the next thing is like, take it off and give it to me. And if you say no, they just do this. I'll show you the size of the knife. I speak to young people. This is what the young people are facing. They show you the size of the knife. And you're kind of like, if you're wise, you run, if you can run. Or you take off the jacket and give them. But you don't fight them. This is what our young people are facing on a daily basis. Trust me, I'm in the know. I hear about it. Brothers and sisters, how do we support the testimony of our church? By living a godly life. We're not just living for ourselves. We're living for Jesus. I've got three statements. Live for God, to close. Live for God. Live for your higher self. Live your life for God, or live your life through God for other people. Live for God. Live for your higher self, your higher calling. And live your life through God for other people. That is our Christian duty. You signed up for the army. You enlisted for life. You've been made a corporal. Now suck it up and get on with it. Stop having a pity party. Stop trying to play tit for tat. You won't win. You won't be happy. Your flesh might be happy, but you won't be happy with the outcome. Live such a life that you influence other people by your good character. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Thank you for listening to the message today. We hope it blessed you. And if it did, please like, comment and subscribe for more videos from Micah. And don't forget to click the notification bell to see when they're uploaded. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you in the next one.